Welcome to another Functionized Podcast. This is your mad scientist, Jim. Next to me in spirit is Beauty Brains Braun Shante, who is seeing a crap ton of clients today. Definitely wanted to be here. And when I say in spirit, she's still with us. She will be on more podcasts. So rest assured, she'll be around for a long time to come. Little news with Functionized. Our Fit Lab is moving down the block to four merchant sway for the most efficient, effective, and always proven method of achieving your top health, both brain and body fitness. You get in the Fit Lab 15 minutes once a week. Like I said, always, always, always proven. Little Fit Lab website update www.fitlabnj.com which can also be found on our usual functionized.com website. Today's special guest is an expert in ADHD, and I say an expert because of his vast wealth of knowledge, his fast brain facility and technology, as well as his new book, ADHD, Flipping It on the Head. Dr. Jim Poole, Founder of Fast Brain and Growing Child Pediatrics is an affinity for helping those with ADHD find and utilize their strengths. With his passion, he founded Fast Brain. Got two eyes in that brain, by the way. A national program for those with attention, focus, and or mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. The program has served over 5,000 people of all ages with ADHD and or other medical issues. The integrative approach of Fast Brain has helped over 4,000 students reach the AB on role at school and supported 94% of adults in the program in getting to a positive place in life. Since its founding in 1998, Growing Child Pediatrics has been able to serve over 10,000 patients and now boasts seven locations throughout North Carolina. Among his many accomplishments, Dr. Poole has played an integral role in bringing the topic of child care to the forefront of political conversation by testifying to U.S. Senate and Senator Kennedy on the state of child care in the United States. As a spokesperson and advocate for higher access to quality child care, he developed the first five-star child care centers in North Carolina and the first sick child care center. Dr. Poole has also founded Camp Challenge for Children with Asthma in North Carolina and Healthy Child Care America for American Academy for Pediatrics. As U.S. Army Materials Service Medical Recipient, he has served on the Governmental Task Force for Mental Health. Dr. Poole is also a Rotarian Paul Fund Harris Fellow who co-chairs the National Tribal Conference. Dr. Poole is more than just doctor as he can be found playing in national tennis tournaments, golfing, and enjoying a myriad of sports with his wife of over 40 years. Congratulations to that, Dr. Poole. His three sons and eight grandchildren. Through, he currently resides in North Carolina. He's also lived in El Paso for three years and is a big fan. Absolutely loved it. Without further ado, let's get to the Functionized podcast. Dr. Poole, thank you so very much for being with us. It is greatly appreciated to have you here. And the topic... Oh, Jim, I, I, mm-hmm. yeah, I appreciate you having me, Jim. Oh, once I saw Dr. Jim, I just felt a little resonating there and said, you know what, I want to talk to this guy. <laughs> Yeah, well, I saw. I looked up your little website. You're into all kinds of things, so yeah. you're obviously fast brain. So I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you. It's kind of jumped off the page here. Fast brain. You spell it with two eyes. So where did the extra eye yeah, come from? It, it was very well thought out. I was uh, taking care of a teenage girl who was she was head cheerleader. She was president of her class. She was all everything, all over the place, couldn't focus. So I had a great meeting with her and her mother, and, and she's in high school. And as they're leaving the room, she starts crying. Mm-hmm. And I go, oh, I thought I did good here. And uh, she uh, says, well, you're putting me on a pill, and you tell me I have ADHD, so therefore something's wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, we got we got to change the name. And at 2 in the morning, I came up with the name Fast Brain because I, w- I couldn't, I wasn't asleep and I jumped out of bed and typed it into the computer and misspelled it. <laughs> and so my uh, left side of the brain said, you know, you're an idiot. You misspelled it. And the right side said, let's go with it. 
and we have gone with it, and people just love the idea that they're fast programming. Even I was, uh, I was playing Rod Brindamore. He he wouldn't remember <laughs> this. He's now co- head coach of the Hurricanes, and he and I were both at the physical therapist at the same time. And I was, work. He was going like crazy on a exercise bike because he had a torn ACL, and he was just going nuts. And I'm working out with one pound pink weights because I had a torn <laughs> PC, a torn shoulder. And uh, so I, he's laughing. He said, well, I'm not fast. I'm not ADD. And I said, oh, no, no, you're fast. Brain. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm that. So it, it's a, it gives us the idea that we are different, and, but it's okay. And, that, and that's what we're all about. Now, individuals that have or diagnosed with what's called ADHD, typically have a label, right. and it can kind of be a little bit destructive at times to be labeled pretty much anything if it's not uh, overly flattering. So what do you think about it being destructive, and how can we kind of spin that around a little bit to make it more positive? Because there are so many individuals that are very successful in this world that suffer from symptoms of ADHD. Well, I... I the whole reason for fast brain and my clinic is a fast brain clinic. My medical diagnosis is an ADHD diagnosis. Uh, I was at a medical meeting with about 250, 300 physicians and they were doing brain scans showing the difference between a, an MRI scan of a person with ADHD and somebody that doesn't. Mm-hmm. And they're kind of blanks and there's, you know, we have decreased, maybe potentially decreased dopamine in different areas of our brain and so forth and so on. And I stood up and I said, well, I went to Clemson and I uh, I have ADD, so I guess my brain's got holes in it too. And everybody laughed. <laughs> and then I said, so how come I made it through med school? I played college sports. I played tennis. Uh, I have the largest pediatric practice in North Carolina. I was head of pediatrics when I was in the army in Stuttgart, Germany, mm-hmm. and you're telling me I have a disability and you want me to tell my patients they have a disability. I, I was just livid because it's not that we have a disability. We're, we're different. So Jim, if I could tell you one quick story with that mm-hmm. is I, I look at us as the difference uh, uh, that we're a difference between a racehorse and a plow horse, for instance. A plow horse, you know, plows the North 40, the Farmer stops, takes off the reins, goes in, has lunch, comes back, and the horse is still sitting there. And where's the racehorse? You put him in a corral, he goes to all four corners of the corral. Um, I was at, I've only been to one Kentucky Derby party in my life, and I was invited to this this party, and we're standing around, and the the race starts on the big screen TV, and the guy says, so what do you do? And I said, well, I have this thing called fast brain. He said, well, what's that like? And I said, well, it's like all those horses. None of them want to get into the into the shoe. And then they took off, and I said, notice none of them run in a straight line. And so everybody laughs. And, and so then I turned back to the group of about eight or nine guys. And one guy says, well, what about that horse 23 in last place on the first turn? And I said, well, that's interesting. I said, in real life, we would – pull him out and, and you know maybe we tell him he needs to go home for remedial horse racing or he didn't eat well and he's just not a good horse and and he's not following directions and you know it's too much screen time and all that stuff and but in my world i still promote that horse because one day that horse might turn out to be something about i don't know 30 seconds later, because I've turned away from the screen, another one of the guys said, look at your horse 23 on the back stretch, and he's in the middle of the race. Well, now I'm yelling at a TV screen at somebody else's house, and I've never <laughs> done that. And, of course, around the last turn, 23 is in, uh, he's gotten into, uh, gotten himself into fourth place, and then as I'm screaming, guess who won the race? Yeah. Horse 23. Yeah. And so I said, and that's what fast brain's all about. Your child may be in last place around the first turn, say in the first, second, third grade, fifth grade, eighth grade. But 100% of my kids end up going to college that I take care of. They all get to AB honor roll. And what the idea is that once they understand that they're okay, then they get out into business and they do phenomenal. And so when you talk about we have the disabilities, um, I wouldn't say that we have a disability. I would say that 
we do things differently and and I have strengths. So I would much rather be thought of as, as my strengths instead of my, my disabilities, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now, you have quite a mm-hmm. distinguished career uh, leading up to this point. Is there any point before that you started or your schooling, your research? Um, I'm sure you've got to be pretty decent in uh, some sports here, tennis, golf. Um, is there any point that you actually were struggling yourself? Well, I I did I, I I couldn't get into college in today's world. I mean, you got to have really good grades to get into all the good schools. <laughs> I mean, I laugh. I went I went to Clemson, and I'm I'm going to go down, and I'm on the president's leadership council, and I kind of laugh at that because uh, now they had thirty four thousand applicants for thirty four hundred places. Mm-mm-mm. I'm doing a mental health course for the school of nursing, and she I said. I've got somebody that I want you to get in, and I'm talking to the dean. And she said, okay, Jim. I said, well, how hard is it? Oh, not too hard. 4,000 applicants, 187 spots, 4.2 average. Wow. My <laughs> but, goodness. Holy cow. So, what, yeah, so what I, where I struggle is um, uh, I have an auditory learning issue. So I have difficulty learning by hearing. So I have to take notes. Mm-hmm. And when I was – at first taking notes in med school, I was panicked. I had a 75 draft number. I was headed to Vietnam. Uh, couldn't do the the uh, overhead projector. The guy had a crank on it. And by the time I looked up, my working memory wasn't long enough. And I was sitting beside a guy named George Rainsford, and I always laugh. Uh, uh, George just frustrated me to death. We were really good friends, but the guy could learn in two days, which took me a week to learn. And I said, you're not taking notes. And he said, no, I'm buying them from Mark. <laughs> and so I ended up buying my notes in med school, and that's what everybody ended up doing. And that's how I got through. So I, my struggle was a real panic um, in medical school. Uh, but, and that even continued in my residency because you would be around the, around the bedside talking, and I would have to take notes and then go study my notes real quick. So, but I learned, Jim, what I learned was that there are ways to adapt. Mm-hmm. And if you look at all the very successful, fast brain CEOs, and even yourself, uh, we are into all kinds of different things. We adapt real quickly. We, we try new things. We fail three times, and it's okay because we've learned three ways not to do it, and the analytical person will fail once and not try again. So we've got a lot of strengths and that kind of thing. So that's how I, I kept going. But, yeah, the, my issues were always – and. Mm-hmm. I stole my brother's Ritalin when, uh, <laughs> I, to get me through med school. Oh, geez. We have some similar paths on some of that yeah. stuff. <laughs> when it comes to caring for others, what have you found to be some of the most critical and successful pieces? My most critical piece is I want the child to understand that they're okay. okay. That, that's uh, We probably have two or three tear jerky moments in my office every every day because some child or whether that child is uh uh five or six whether they're high school whether they're college or whether they're an adult uh they realize that they're okay because i teach i take care of the whole gamut and when they come in and say you know what i realize for the first time i'm okay so it's the idea is teaching parents that their child's okay i give a parent talk twice a month to about anywhere between 40 and 70 parents. And the underlying, when they leave, they all say, you gave me hope for the first time with my child. Mm. And, and that's what it is, that God didn't say whoops when he made us. we got to find your child's strength or, or your personal strength and then work with the rest of this stuff. Yes, I have, you know, I'm, I'm all over the place and, you know, I, and I, you know, I, I, the book that I wrote, uh, I gave it to my son, Matthew. I was so excited about it. And he's, he's very analytical. And he said, dad, and I said, yes, Matthew. And he goes, it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he, re- he redid it, you know, and then my wife looked at it real strong and she, she checked all the grammar and that took us about many months to get back from all my grammar mistakes. <laughs> but we all have, again, we all have strengths. And if we can figure that out when I'm taking care of others, those are the things I give them some memory tricks. I give the kids speed, speed learning tricks, speed reading tricks in the mm-hmm. office. 
and I'll say, let me see how dumb you are, and then I, I, they blitz through these things, and I say, wow, what if I told you everybody that did this can go to AB honor roll, and that's that's what they that's what they do. Now, when it comes between, when you see individuals, different sessions there, um, a lot of what we do is continuing homework. Uh, what kind of homework do you have for even the parents? Because there's no one-size-fits-all approach to this, I'm sure. So what types of things do you have parents stress upon to their children in between times when they work with you? Uh, learning is, is best learned in chunks of time. We were taught to sit for an hour. Uh, we found that, depending on the age, somewhere between uh, 15, maybe even 10 minutes to 25 minutes. I go 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. and then take a five-minute break just before you take the break. Review everything you just went over to make sure you know it. And then at the end of the night, you review tonight's stuff, and you do a quick review of the last four days. If you do that, it, you're guaranteed A's. It's, it, you say, well, that's pretty simple, and it is, and that's, that's what we do, and that's what we stress is how to do that, how to learn, how to read. Um, people read differently. You might need – I read with a finger and a three-by-five card. Um, when I do math, I use graph paper. Uh, we, we, again, we're stressing the positives, going back over and over things until you get it. Uh, is, and that's how the Army, when I was in the Army, I mean, you started, they always start everybody with getting up and making your bed. But everybody, and you do that every day. Mm -hmm. And you start and you add one thing to it. And before long, you're a, a strong fighting force. The other thing the Army does is that they... Uh, they give you slight promotions from, you know, you're a private, then you're a private first class, and all these promotions are just as much as going from uh, lieutenant colonel to colonel. I mean, it is the same, and so you want to always believe in your child but give them positives. We all do better with positives than with negatives. And, uh, so often, uh, just count at home how many times she said, you know, uh, sit in here. Why don't you sit down? Now get back in here. All right, well, I just gave three negatives. Now mm -hmm. I've got to give five positives to overshadow the three negatives I just did. So we want them to have positives, you know, back. So, uh, and so it's a positive program. I don't mean being a helicopter pa uh, parent where you do everything for your child. Lots of studies showing that if you make your child work, and understand and helping in the family and helping other people that if they do that as a child when they're in their 30s they're about 90 something are successful whereas if they don't do that only about 24 percent are successful that's an amazing so i am for i am for discipline and support absolutely i mean it's amazing even as a parent how much it helps out if the kids pick their plates up instead of the parent clearing a table after a meal and uh doing the dishes uh, it seems, at oh. least in our household, other than just making it easy for mom and dad here, to they seem to start taking more initiative on doing other things. All of a sudden, they're picking up their shoes. They are um, taking initiative, even starting to do their homework without being asked. It, it's kind of a positive cycle that occurs. Is that something that right. you typically find and as well? Perfect. You're, you're exactly right. And, and, you know, and if you spend, if you buy them a bicycle, but you only buy half of it, Mm -hmm. They work for the other half. When it's raining, guess who runs out and gets the bike? The child does. Hmm. It's their bike. So I'll buy him half a bike. I, I like that idea. Half a bike. <laughs> half a bike. Half of top rank, you know, instead of buying $125 basketball shoes, they have to earn money to pay for half of it. it is... um, that little bit. Yes, you can afford it as the parent. Mm -hmm. And guess the parent next door does it, but that's not where value comes from. And, and I think the bottom line is, is getting your child to realize that they have value, that they personally have value. Maybe that's where school suffers, because if you jump in kids early in school and, you know, uh, and you're doing badly and you need to sit at the back of the room and we're pulling you out for this and uh, all those kinds of things, then the, value, the child feels like they don't have value and that they're not worth anything. And that's where negativity makes a personality and that's where we don't want to do that negativity does breed more negativity doesn't it it, it does it's you have any uh thoughts i mean turning negative to positive i mean it seems like the majority of reinforcement is negative do you have any examples that you could share of 
how to spin things and make it more positive reinforcement? Uh, first of all, it, it has to be a mindset in the parent's mind that I have got to become positive. Uh, that's that's all there is to it. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> uh, we had one the other day where the kid was acting up and said, Mom, you just get mad at me and you're never positive. And you go, no, I positively feel you're acting up. <laughs> um, but <laughs> if, uh, we, we do have to spin it in a way that that is positive, but also you can't get away with stuff either. So, you know, you, you clean up the room and you cleaned up half of it. And you say, well, that half looks great. This half doesn't look so good. But I did tell you that that half, let's make this half look like that half. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you work with your child. If they're going to only clean up five, you know, you're going to do 95% of the room. Instead of having them go in and then you get mad at them the rest of the time, why not work with them and do it together? And then they finish off doing 5% of the room and you praise them in front of somebody. And praise them on the telephone when they, you know they're listening or praise them in front of the grandparents. Uh, you also, hopefully 5% becomes 10%, 10 becomes 20%, and slowly they see the value of, of doing it. So it's, uh, it's, and then I believe in a reward system. And you say, well, is that, you know, is that bribery? Um, it's bribery if, if we're going to, you know, we're trying to get something bad out of them. But if we're trying <laughs> to get them to do well, we go to work for a reward of work and a reward to help other people right. and reward of of being paid we want to i believe in paying the kids let them let them earn their time uh the number of you know we hadn't even touched on the problems with screen time I mean, it's a huge problem it, it's an addiction uh, we know these kids their dopamine response to the good feel of doing the video game and then parents don't want to take it away because the child will have a tantrum oh mm -hmm. my goodness a mm -hmm. tantrum in a child and it's the same thing with the two-year-old you know, having the tantrum in the grocery store, you're looking around to see what other parents are there. You, and then if, if you don't see anybody, then you yell at your kid. <laughs> and if you see somebody you know, you you say, okay, you can have the candy. Uh, <laughs> and so what have we taught them? You could have the candy. Right. So I believe in a, um, in a three-pronged system. You give them a warning, you then tell them what's going to happen, and then you act. And then you as a parent do not need to scream. Uh, police officer, last time I got a ticket, I'm – saying, oh, please don't do it, please don't do it. And, you know, he didn't yell at me. He just quietly wrote the ticket. And then said, well, don't do it, don't do it. And he goes, <laughs> yes, yeah, see you in court. Court it off and handed it to me. And, you know, he, his heart rate didn't go up, his blood pressure again. That's how we need to treat our kids. The speed limit sign has to be set. If it's not set, we get a warning. So if you haven't told the child that they can't do that, mm -hmm. then give them a warning. And then tell them what the discipline's going to be. If the discipline isn't set, you give them a warning again. And you just that, and that keeps us from knee jerking things. So again, it's all back to I think it's just a positive approach, a positive way of being a parent, and but but letting the kid understand, push it back on the child, you know. Absolutely. Kind of what, you know. No. I I really you know I try to when I'm looking at attention and stuff, you know, ADD is is both it's a it's a focusing issue. It's also an impulsive issue. Um, it, it's it's. Uh, it's an attention issue. And, and when I give a talk to, I give talk to about 40 to 70 parents twice a month, I'll say a helicopter's landing out front. What are y'all all, all going to do? And they all say, well, we'll look at the helicopter. And I said, exactly. So I guess you have all have ADD. <laughs> but your child, what are they looking for? They're looking for the helicopter because it's more interesting than the boring teacher. And the video game is active. It's colorful it's noisy you can do it as many times as you want you can fail as much as you want you get to try over as much as you want why to get to the next level and you brag about the next level there's all this positive and school doesn't have any of that that's that's where we've got to change our school system have you done any work in doing so yeah um i looked at i studied uh actually playing music uh in the in the room and mm -hmm. My contention was that if you played music, you'd do better on tests. And the way you test medicine, it's, I hate to say it, it's not real complicated. You, you give the child the medicine at 8 o'clock in the morning, say, and you test them every hour to do 10 minutes of math 
that they can do, and you see how many they do and how many they get right. And you do that every hour over a certain length of time, and there's a curve, and therefore this medicine works or not, plus you walk around and you see how they're, if they're still or not. Uh, so I did that with music. Uh, I couldn't, I forgot my music that day, and the only medicine, uh, the only medicine, the only music I had was Boogie Wonderland from Happy Feet. So I had 25 kids in the room uh, between 11 and 13, and I'm playing Boogie Wonderland from Happy Feet, and they're doing math tests, and they're all dancing at their table. And I did it without music and did it with music. I realized this didn't work. I'm out apologizing to the parents. Hmm. My nurse calls me back in, and lo and behold, one kid without music did 34 problems in 10 minutes and got four right. On Boogie Wonderland, he did 44 problems and got 44 problems right. And across the board, everybody way increased their scores and just nailed it. So I, we're using music in the Raleigh area. A lot of schools and a lot of, a lot of teachers, are, and I did this years ago, are using music. So we, we do that. They understand that uh, a lot of, there, there are a lot of really good teachers that understand this. And, and the teachers are in have trouble because, you know, if we're ever in an adult meeting and somebody's cell phone goes off or mm-hmm. they're over there, somebody's talking in the corner, that just kind of bothers us a little bit, even though the room's got 30 people in it. Imagine every day four kids that are all over the place getting out of their chair. And so teachers have a have a tough time, and so it's, it's not easy for them. But it, it's all in the approach, I believe. I believe you're absolutely right. If the teacher will keep an open mind to that allow the kids to thrive and that's what their job is to make those kids thrive isn't it yes yes and yeah well, and and hunt for the strengths yes you got to find their strengths what are my strengths if, if i had to learn by listening i would have flunked out of high school much less uh medical school so it's uh it's it's right and then and then learn by drawing i'll never forget my physics teacher i he gave me an f on a physics test and senior in high school, I said, Mr. Brown, I can't get an F. I know I didn't make an F. He said, well, you didn't draw a picture. And he's, he says, after class, and he's not even looking at me. And so I'm pleading with him, but that ain't going anywhere. And I said, well, if I draw a picture at each one, will it help? He said, it might. And I drew a picture, and then he gave me an A, and I think I only Jeez. changed the answer one time. But he knew that I did better if I drew the picture and could see it. And so from then on, I draw pictures about everything. The businesses I've started, the different stuff I do, there's always a picture that goes with it. So I'm, I'm definitely that guy that drives it, you know, does it on the napkin type thing. I've, I've been one of those. That's good you uh, figured it out and actually uh, would argue your grade, too. <laughs> F to an A, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that one, too. <laughs> is, is that in Fast Brain? Make sure you argue your grades every time and uh, draw a picture? <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> now, one of Einstein's adages holds that creativity is more important than knowledge. And I was reading that uh, you kind of relate Einstein's story to being the patron saint of fast brain. Can you uh, tell me a little bit about this? Say just the idea of creativity is so important. Mm-hmm. It, well, you know, if, if you look in... Um, Go into a second grade class and say, how many people in here are artists? And everybody raise their hand. You go into a sixth grade class, how many people are artists? Nobody is. Right. Uh, and so maybe Susan is, and that's only one person. And so it gets to be very, very frustrating that way. So uh, I'm going, well, if that's, if that's the case, then why are we dumbing down creativity? Because if you, if you take away somebody's imagination, they can't be creative. And then imagination and creativity, you end up with a passion. And that passion is what gets us through life. And when you become an adult in the business, uh, that's, that's an issue. I, I probably shouldn't say this name, but years ago, Procter & Gamble went to Clemson and talked to the business school. And the business lady was telling me, and I was talking to them about Fast Brain and creative people. And she said, oh, I got five kids that are just going to blow this out in the water. And at the time... Parker and Gamble's test was for the analytical person, and none of her key people passed the test to get a job with Procter and Gamble. Mm-hmm. But if you look, there was a book, Good to Great, by Jim Collins, phenomenal book. I did not like the book. I liked his second book, 
because all those great companies failed because they didn't adapt and they weren't quick mm-hmm. and they didn't use creativity. They they stuck with the, you know, the bottom line. So I think creativity and creativity in today's world, my goodness. I mean, if you don't, if you're not out there creating and changing on a moment by moment, your your business is in the gutter fast. So. Oh, absolutely. So that's so the whole thing is to try to try to keep it and to and to take the child that is creative early and keep those creative passions going. What is your what is your twelfth grade twelfth year old passion about? Well, I don't know. He plays video games. Well, have you taken him anywhere outside of the video game world yourself as a parent? Are you going out and spending one on one time that doesn't include that? Do you have a cell phone in your hand when you're sitting at the dinner table? Who's more important, you or the cell phone or the person who's going to call me? And, and for instance, if if you call me, Jim, and I'm, and I'm working or I'm talking with somebody and you call me, I go, well, that should be very important that I that I talk to you because it's going to be about this podcast. But who becomes more important, the, you on a break or me talking to the person in front of me? Because everybody that calls me is on a break of some kind. Mm -hmm. So we should not be jumping to those people and and responding. So, again, no TVs at dinner time, no TVs after supper in the household, no cell phones when we're all sitting around talking or at dinner time. Those kinds of things show importance. And and then that, again, where can we be creative in the household? What can we do together? Uh, uh, starting a business. One of my young patients was starting a business the other day, and I, I never forget watching the YouTube work. And my dad made me do this, but uh, you can start a business, but you got to rent the lawnmower from me, and you got to buy the gas from me. Mm. You know that kind of thing. So it's it's all learning. Yes. Mm. I think you're the first person that I've ever heard from that did not actually come out of my mouth first about. If somebody is in front of you, they're of utmost importance. And that phone call can wait. Why are you texting others in front of other people if they're supposed to be the ones that you're focusing on or the task at hand? Um, I'm glad others think the same way. It's it, oh, it's comforting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and we need to and keep and you've got a great avenue through your podcast is to keep that uh, keep that in the forefront. You know, ask people what. Because I'll, in front of my talk with my parents, I have, I'll have hold the cell phone and I'll act like I'm getting ready to answer it. And I say, so what's more important, all of you or this person who's on a break? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you don't ever, and I, so I tell them, please never answer your phone if you're in my office. <laughs> mm, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah. Uh, your so your book stuff. your book fast brain if you had one big takeaway from it i know there's a lot of valuable information there if there's one big takeaway though what would that be i yeah it's called flipping adhd on its head mm-hmm. and it is about the fast brain uh my one takeaway is your child has strengths and you as a parent have strengths and the deal is to find that in your child and to get them to believe in their strengths you do that one thing, they're they're going to be highly successful. But they they believe in themselves, and Jim, as you know, especially in all the things you've been through, you can't give somebody self esteem by oh you can do this. They have to go do it themselves. So once they do it, you you then praise them for they not oh I knew you could do that. No, that's not what you say. You said you did it. You know I love the quote Yoda says there's no such thing as try you either do it or you don't <laughs> so if you do our yes. review technique if you're out there working you do those things you praise the kid for what they do um, I was talking to a division one uh, team uh, all their all their coaches uh, and one of the coaches came up to me and said we we got a phenomenal team my best pitcher is uh, in a slump and Pitcher was ADD, mm-hmm. too, and, I mean, he was just all over the place. And uh, so I said, okay, next game, after two good innings, pull him, pull him. He said, well, we don't do it that way. We wait till he's messing up. I said, I know you do. Pull him after two good innings. So he did. And then the deal was that the next time when he's out on the mound, go out and you're having trouble, you tell him about the fastball that he pitched against such and such a team. But you don't talk baseball. You talk about – the girl in the red hat or the weather or something else. You just 
get his mind on something else, and then say, I want the fastball in the outside corner like he did three weeks ago. Throw the glove in his paint and turn and stalk off. And that pitcher, that team made it to the Super Regionals, and that he got pulled at the very last, and they lost by one run in like the 14th inning or something. Hmm. And and then uh, the the same team, another team, uh, back to Clemson again. I the coach said, I'm getting guys thrown out at second base, and I said, Well, what happens when they get thrown out? Do you kind of get on them? And he said, Well, yeah. I mean, they got thrown out. And I said, Well, why don't you praise them when they try and get thrown out? And lo and behold, he started praising them, and they started not getting thrown out after that because that little hesitancy, nice. should I do this? Could I do this? Am I going to get yelled at mm-hmm. to try to use my creativity and passion? And uh, and I loved it. I saw in the paper later, a couple of weeks later, we're changing our method. We're going to run the base, base pads hard, and they, they did very well that year. I love that. So, just flipping so, that mindset again, just a half I, a I, I think that's Yeah, I think that's our whole idea on the book is that it's just – ways to help parents become positive let children and adolescents and adults understand that we're, we're good we mm-hmm. just gotta don't don't believe everything we hear that we're bad <laughs> and that we're not we're not bad we're, we're good we just got we're we're the racehorse we're not the plow horse and that's okay uh you know and uh uh, Ned Hallowell, a good friend of mine, and, and Ned talks about a race car, you know, and he says we're race cars with bicycle brakes. We need we need some maybe some other brakes, but he doesn't try to make the race car into a, a little VW, you know. Mm-hmm. It's it's a race car. <laughs> so believe so, in your believe in your race cars is what I would have to tell everybody. So how can the world purchase flipping ADHD on the head? Um, it's on Amazon and it's in the Barnes and Noble area in North Carolina, but I, probably the easiest is to get on Amazon.com. Mm-hmm. And then we also have a fat, fast brain with two eyes.com website. So I appreciate you letting me say that. Of course. And we are actively involved with changing that whole thing to give people and parents, uh, we have a lot of videos on it, but we're getting ready to come up with a real, uh, real exciting parenting program that people will be able to get into and do a lot of this online. Yeah. I saw a bunch of those videos, and they're definitely uh, worthwhile in checking out. So definitely highly recommend for all the listeners to jump on FastBrain.com and hit up those videos. If individuals wanted to get in touch with you, Dr. Poole, is the your website the best way to get in touch with you? That probably is, yes. Okay. FastBrain with two eyes.com and leave a note, and we'll, we definitely will get back with you. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Well, I... And I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, though I can't treat long distance, unfortunately, medicine doesn't allow us to do that. Mm-hmm. But uh, be glad to answer, you know, global questions and help you see if you need uh, help in different ways. And we can talk about medicine. I do use medicine, but I also use diet, exercise, music, um, supplements. There's a lot you can you can utilize to help your child. Time management deals. Uh, help in the school, learning chunks. There's, there's just a variety of stuff that we can use to help. But again, I thank you very much for your for your time and allowing me to be on your podcast. Oh, the, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so very much. You've been a, a vast wealth of information, and your book is even more information. So go out, get it, and read it. Dr. Poole, thank you so very much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jim. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Take care, Dr. Paul.